Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Wonderful to see everybody. And we're very excited to be talking about Superman from East Coast to West Coast. Um, so I'm going to ask Larry a few questions to get going about the book process and about the thesis of the book, which was that Superman has both been enduring and has evolved over time. And we've all known him at different eras of his life. But before we get into that, Larry, can you talk about how you sold your publisher, Random House, on the idea of a biography of somebody who, after all, is not real other than in our minds? How do you sell a biography of a fictional character? Sure. So what I want to start off by saying is how much nicer it is to be in front of this audience today than the last time I did this a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about one of the most malevolent characters in American history, Joe McCarthy. And to be here and to get to talk about the most upbeat and heroic character, Superman, is a big change and a nice change and a perfect post-election change after we... Um, McCarthy's story maybe becomes a little less relevant after what happened two weeks ago. Uh, but I don't know how much all of you know, you're all very smart people and you read a lot of books and you've probably written a lot of books. And I don't know how much you know about the process of what is difficult and what is easy in putting together a book. But to me, the single most difficult thing in the whole book process is coming up with an idea that you like and that you can convince a publisher to like. And so I had written one book for my editor, Random House, which was a biography of a guy named Satchel Paige, arguably the best baseball pitcher in the history of the universe, and a story that was a story of Satchel Paige, but using his life to tell a second biography, which was of a character named Jim Crow. And I had a blast writing that book, and my publisher, I think, had a good time with it. And Random House um, had enough fun with it that when they had their meeting of all their executives from all around the world um, in New York, they brought me in to talk to these people about Satchel Page and to bring them for one night to a very large luxury box at Shea Stadium. So. We had high expectations, and I told my editor I had a new book that I wanted to discuss with him. But I said I wasn't going to tell him what that book was about until I saw him in person. And I was going to partly show rather than just tell him about what that book was about. And I want to show you what I did. We met in his office at Random House, and I was there with just one person who was my book agent. And we put down in front of this editor this picture. And can you all see the picture? You can't see the picture. Okay, hold we're on. Seeing, we're seeing the thumbnails. So we need to... You are. So you're not seeing... We um, see all of your pictures as opposed to just the one you want to show us. Okay. And the one I want to show you is... Um, hold on. It is a... Uh, I wonder why. Is it on your screen now? Okay, so the, the picture that I want to show you, bottom line, is um, it was a picture of Superman. It was an enormous picture of Superman. And what I said to my agent was, we would tell him the first 30 seconds whether this guy liked the picture or not. Can you hold up, actually, Ari, that picture of a, a picture, any of the pictures there of Superman, that one there? So that's what I basically put in front of my editor. And this guy immediately had the biggest smile on his face that I've ever seen. I knew this editor for a while. And what it said to me was that the task was no longer going to be selling it to him. It was going to be selling it to his bosses up the line at the publishing house. And essentially, you either love Superman or you don't get what the heck we're talking about with Superman. And this guy told us in these 30 seconds that, he was an easy sell. It turned out that he had grown up with Superman. And it turned out as we went up the chain at Random House, everybody seemed to be a DC Comics guy or woman and had exactly the same reaction. And that not only worked at Random House, but I want to show you really quickly. a picture that's on my wall. Can you see this? So what that is, 
is the front of the Sunday New York Times book section. The entire front cover was this picture. And I tried to understand after the fact why the heck I ended up on the front of, it's what every author dreams about, being on the front of the Sunday New York Times. And it turned out when, when you're on the front cover, you're also on a podcast with, a, with the Times book editor interviewing you on a radio show with potentially a million listeners. And the reason that I ended up on the front of the Sunday New York Times was that the one guy who mattered, who was the New York Times book editor, grew up as a Superman kid. And he decided, why not have fun? This was his childhood hero. So it was a fictional character. I had no real idea how I was going to carry this off, but it didn't matter because all the only people who mattered who were the editors and publisher at Random House and people like this New York Times um, book editor were like Ari, Superman kids when they were growing up and like Ari's son is now and that's what matters. And so I had my topic. It was something that I was in love with and then all I had to do was figure out how to make it into a book. So that's a good segue, Larry. How do you research a nonfiction book? You're a nonfiction writer. How do you do research on a nonfiction for a nonfiction book about a fictional character? So what I want to say is that every time anybody writes a biography of somebody that they are using, no matter how interesting that person's life is, they're using that narrow, small story to tell a bigger story. So when I wrote a biography of Satchel Page, as I've already mentioned, it was half a biography of Satchel Page and half a biography of the bigger story of Jim Crow in America. Satchel Page happened to have been born in Alabama in the year the Jim Crow laws passed, and he was the one of the earliest guys to integrate baseball, so his life was the entire history of Jim Crow in America. When I wrote a biography of Bobby Kennedy, it was partly about Bobby Kennedy, and it was partly the bigger story of how America changed from the 1950s Cold War era to the era of the tumultuous 1960s. And Bobby's life was a perfect lens into that change. Superman worked the same way. He was a fictional character, but he was, as I argued with this book, the longest lasting hero in American history. At the time I was writing the book, Superman was celebrating his 75th birthday. And during those 75 years, there was nobody who was bigger for longer than Superman. So I wanted to use his life as a look into why America embraces the heroes that we do. And what I did was partly look at him as a real character who was number one in the comic books, on radio, on TV, and in the movies. And that was very real flesh and blood kinds of things. And I also looked at the fictional character that two kids from Cleveland, Ohio named Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster had dreamed up. And that was not real, but it was a very real sense of our aspirations and what we think is important in our heroes. So I'm not sure that was a clear answer, but that was the answer that I took to my editors and tried to take into my research process in spending two years with Superman. So, Larry, Superman is also a Jewish story. Two questions. One, when you started the research, did you expect it to be, the, the Jewish story, to be a central part of telling the story of Superman? Um, and also, what can you reflect on the fact that one of the most iconic mainstream American heroes really has strong Jewish roots Right. So what I knew when I started writing the book was that it was two Jewish kids from Cleveland, this Jerry Siegel, the writer, and Joe Schuster, the artist who had dreamed up Superman. The more I started looking, I realized that the people who brought him to life in the comic books were two Jewish guys named Leibowitz and Donenfeld, that the people who brought him to life in every medium that he was in, from radio to TV to film had Jewish connections. But 
the most interesting story to me was the way that Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster disguised his Jewish roots in the way they presented him in giving birth to Superman. So it was like an inside joke. Superman, as any of you who are Superman fans know, um, came to Earth with the Kryptonian name Kal El. That was his um, name in the comic books when he was first presented to us. And as you all know, El, whether it's in Israel or Daniel, means God. And Kal is the root of the Hebrew words for voice and vessel. And so the first little inside joke with Superman is that he was coming to Earth with this name that essentially meant not just that he was a vessel of God, but that he was a very special figure in our, um, in our comic book, um, but in our mythology. The whole story of Superman coming to Earth from a planet that was being destroyed, this planet of Krypton, was to me the story of Moses. It was essentially, in this case, the baby prophet being put not into a basket to be floated on a river, he was put into a spaceship to be floated to Earth. When he got here, it was the ultimate Gentile couple, Martha um, and now, why am I blanking on Martha and somebody will help me. This book was 15 years ago. Um, his father, the other Kent character, two ultimate Gentiles who rescued him and adopted him and quickly realized that they had a very exceptional orphaned child. The whole Superman myth was founded on three elements in our comic books. It was founded, as we know, on truth, and justice and the American way, which I think, and Ari will correct me if he thinks I'm wrong, um, were straight out of the Mishnah, where it was codified, the whole Jewish oral tradition was founded on three important principles of justice and truth and peace. Um, the idea that Superman came to earth and his planet was being destroyed at the very time our whole Jewish world was being destroyed during the Holocaust was one more little inkling that Jerry and Joe had a very particular kind of story and a very Jewish story in mind. And I think that they disguised their story, they did all of this sort of um, surreptitiously was because the idea of an overtly Jewish story back in that era around World War II probably never would have sold, but they loved having this Jewish story behind what they were doing. They told us in every interview that they ever did that they wrote about what they knew and what they knew was the story of Jewish America. They grew up in the Glendale neighborhood of Cleveland, which was majority Jewish. Their school was almost entirely Jewish and they were giving us the story that they knew, which was the story of the Jewish world. So Larry, Superman is both a Jewish story, but it's also a personal story. And, you know, interestingly, both the creators of the Superman comic books and the people who brought him to life on television had lost their fathers. Can you talk a little bit about that and the impact that it had on the creation and evolution of the character? Sure. So I will do that. And could I ask, Eric, could you hold up one more time that issue of Superman number one, the first Superman comic that we ever had? And the I want to tell you, as he's finding that picture, um, the, the father-son story that I think really lay at the root of the Superman story was the story of a guy named Michael Siegel. Michael Siegel was, a, uh, was Jerry Siegel, the creator of Superman's father. And he owned what started out as a schmati store in Cleveland, ended up becoming a little fancier version, a, a haberdashery, a used clothing store in Cleveland, Ohio. And he was a relatively successful entrepreneur. Only one day, a couple large guys went into his store and they tried on a suit 
and he was helping them with that. And then they were much bigger than him. He was there alone. And they walked out of the store with the suit without paying for it. And Michael Siegel started chasing them out the door. And when he got to the threshold of the store, he had a massive heart attack. And he died shortly after he got to the hospital. And Jerry Siegel, who was a barely a teenager, was bereft. He had lost his hero. He had lost his father. And so he was a scribbler of stories. And his buddy, Joe, was a scribbler of artwork to go with those stories. And Ari, can you show us that picture from the first, from Superman number one? Is it... Um, Well, you don't have the image. I was looking. I was going to send ah, people. So it was uh, the one you showed up before. Yeah, the one the one you have here. It just says Giant Action Superman Comics number one. Manual. I don't know if that's one ah, of them, but you don't have right. it. In so here. it is. It is the image, and I wish I have it on my screen here, but I can't seem to. Um, will that come up? Is it up there now? I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna put something up real quick so people can see. It's a very famous image. I, I found yes. whatever. So I found it's the, the image of things. the first Action Comic. And it is a man, um, essentially, uh, who would become Superman, who was um, going out. He was uh, being held up at gunpoint. And that was the first story that Jerry and Joe ever created. And what this was, was essentially the story of what happened to Michael Siegel. It was a little boy's dealing with the death of his father by creating the superhero that he wished could have come and rescued his father. And when we look at anything famous and mythical in our world, it generally has a very human-sized story behind it. And so Superman was one little boy's sense of two things. One, creating a hero that could rescue his father. And the other was like every schlubby Jewish kid growing up, certainly like me, it was the sense that if America, and more importantly, if the girls that we had crushes on in our homeroom, in Jerry's case, uh, the woman who was named Lois, who became the model for Lois Lane, if they could only look inside of us, they would see um, inside of this schlubby character named Clark Kent, there was laying there a real superhero. And that was what Jerry wished people could see in him and wished had been there to rescue his father when Michael Siegel died in his clothing store. Superman's creators weren't afraid to have him take a strong stance. So for example, early on, he stood up to the KKK. He stood up to Hitler. Um, first of all, what do you make of that? Was that considered to be a controversial way to write comics at the time? And then the second question is, what would Superman be standing for and standing up for today? So it was very controversial at the time. The idea that you had comic book heroes doing things that were taken directly out of our headlines and especially had these two Jewish kids taking on Adolf Hitler was controversial because it was before America had decided that it was going to stand up to Hitler or to the KKK or to a lot of these forces. And it was their sense that this ought to be about something more than mythical. It ought to be about real world villains and real world heroes. And while much of America had no idea that Superman was all about a Jewish story, um, the Nazi propaganda apparatus did, and they attacked the Superman for standing up to Adolf Hitler. They attacked, um, they called Jerry, Jerry Siegelach, and it was a very overtly anti-Semitic attack on him that they waged, realizing that having Superman out there standing up to Hitler meant something, not just to little kids, but to people all over the world. And so I think it was injecting a dose of reality into the comic books that were a very new thing and that set the pattern, not just for the DC comic book heroes like Batman who followed, 
but for the whole Marvel comic universe and for our mythology taking on our real enemies. And I think Superman today uh, is and was standing up again for truth, justice, and the American way in a way that, in my mind, that has a very clear implication for today's world and today's controversial political issues. But I'll let um, people who are here today decide what they think truth, justice, and the American way would look like today. So Larry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you showed us a uh, New York Times book review front cover with a giant image of Superman. Um, this book got amazing coverage. Uh, previous books and subsequent books have been New York Times bestsellers, but Superman was not. And why not? What do you make of that? So every um, editor at every publishing house, every senior publishing official in every author is perpetually trying to figure out why some books hit with the public and others don't. And I have never had a book get more attention from fresh air to the cover of the New York Times to just about everywhere than Superman. But in going back afterwards and trying to do a postmortem on it with my editor who bought the book, what we concluded was uh, that more people heard my stories of Superman and Terry Gross had a brilliantly fun time talking about this Jewish character um, that she called not Superman, but Superman. She decided that that um, she was going to have fun. Terry Gross, as you know, is Jewish, and she was going to have fun with this character and have fun with our hour-long interview. But as to why it didn't sell more copies, I'm convinced it's because people were familiar with the story at the end of my talking about it. But most people who love the Superman story were used to reading 13-page, two-syllable stories. They wanted to read comic books. And the idea of sitting down and reading a serious book about a comic book character was something that just wasn't a sell. And honestly, um, my editor and I had so much fun with it that we didn't care whether it sold. The good news was Random House bought my next book on Bobby Kennedy, and that did make the bestseller list. Um, and I'm convinced in a way that the same experience is being repeated now with Joe McCarthy, that I wrote 45 op-eds and essays for newspapers and magazines around the country. It was on fresh air. Uh, the New York Times wrote a profile on it. The Wall Street Journal had it as their lead book section review and yet it has not yet made the bestseller list. And I'm convinced again that people may care about the story of Joe McCarthy, especially at a moment when Donald Trump was using Joe McCarthy's playbook. But to sit down at a moment of national trauma and read a book about a malevolent character like McCarthy might have been too much to expect readers to do. So it is selling well enough, but it's not made the bestseller list. And I sat down again with my publisher at Houghton Mifflin to try to figure out what was going on and why it hasn't made the bestseller list. And what we both came up with is that either asking comic book readers to read a 300 page book or asking a traumatized country to read a 500 page book about a, uh, an anti-hero like Joe McCarthy might be asking too much but when I asked the publisher here and the editor at Random House, were they therefore sorry that they had bought the book? They said what mattered to them was people understanding the story, not buying the book. And I hope that they'll buy the next one or they have bought the next one. So maybe they're telling the truth. So speaking of selling books, Schuster and Siegel sold the rights to Superman for $130. Not 130,000, $130. And yet over time, it's been its own little industry spawning books and comic books and films and action figures and t-shirts and so on. Was $130 the right price? Was that a fair price? And did uh, Siegel and Schuster get, uh, get taken? Well, so the, one of the people who is on our Zoom right now, um, X, spouse was the um, uh, granddaughter of one of the people who paid the $130. And it's a toss up 
which was um, the bigger swindle in American history, selling Manhattan for a pile of beads or selling the rights to Superman for $130. And, but the truth is that Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster had tried everybody in the world to sell their comic book stories. And everybody said, thanks, but no thanks. And they would have paid $130 for somebody to publish it back now 80 something years ago. Um, so it didn't look like a swindle. It looked like an, an enormous opportunity for them. And they ended up becoming relatively wealthy, the two of them, and made, got more fame and more money and more acclaim than they, they had ever dreamed. So calling it a swindle in a way is with 2020 hindsight. While they never got over the fact that they had sold it for so little and they ended up bringing a lawsuit against DC Comics in the days that everybody knew the billion dollar character that Superman was, that again is, is looking back and not appreciating the fact that these two kids got to take their dream and make him the longest lasting hero in American and maybe world history. So yes, I feel badly for them having only gotten $130. And yes, I would love to have the fame that Siegel and Schuster did and to be the kind of bestseller that Superman became. So I don't really feel sorry for them. And over the years, DC Comics um, offered to make it up to them and to their heirs, and they could never quite reach a deal that satisfied everybody, but they had their chance. So, Larry, there's a question from somebody called Avram Baskin, an interesting question. Do you think the people who condemned the first Christopher Reeve movie because they thought it was a Jesus metaphor would have been even more outraged had they known it was really a Jewish story? So if I could ever answer a question as concisely as I would like to be able to answer this one, I would say just yes. But <laughs> taking that a half a step more, I think Christopher Reeve was the perfect Superman and we've never quite been able to duplicate him. I think that um, it was partly the Jesus story, but it was also, um, it was a guy named Mankiewicz who rescued the script for that uh, original Superman, and he was Jewish. As you may know, his uncle was the one who gave us Citizen Kane. He was the one who gave us lots of great movies, including, as I say, rewriting Superman. So it was a story for anybody who wanted to see what they wanted to see in it. It was a, a Jesus story. It was a Moses story. Um, but most of all, it was a story about a hero that had been cemented in our consciousness long before the way that Jerry and Joe wanted him to be. So whatever he became by the time of the movie didn't quite matter because he was already part of who we are as a country and as a hero. So Larry, in chat, there's a dialogue between Cy Zilberstein and Joel Berman asking how uh, Schuster and Siegel made money after that $130 sale. And yes, it's absolutely right. They, they continue to draw comic strips. But can you talk a little bit about the evolution of their own, uh, their careers? Were they successful or as successful following uh, the creation of Superman? What did their post-Superman sale lives look like? Um, it looked like nothing, honestly, um, in terms of ever hitting gold the way they did with Superman. They tried other heroes. None of them quite work. They tried more overtly Jewish heroic characters. None of them ever worked. They struck gold with Superman. They were hired for years and then rehired after they had angrily quit um, by DC Comics that was over the years very generous of them. It made both of them into people who went from living in their parents' attic to living lives of essential luxury. So um, I hope that none of their heirs are on here now when I say that nobody should really feel sorry for Jerry Siegel or Joe Schuster because they were made into wealthy men. Um, they were made into famous men. And the idea that they had given away the rights cheaper than they wanted to, lots of people 
um, in their early days sell things for money that um, that they shouldn't have sold it for. And the idea that these two na naive kids um, undersold their rights, um, that's just what happened. And DC was very generous to them. And I have no a special affinity for DC. It's not part of you know this Warner corporate empire, but over the years, people recognized that Jerry and Joe should be taken care of, and they did take care of them. I want to add one thing before Lisa continues the questioning. That what I enjoyed about this book was um, reading the background history of the of the two people, and then uh, you know about Jerry and Joe. But um, when people asked how they do, I, I from your book, one of the great stories is that Jerry married Lois Lane. Isn't that correct? Um, it is married that um, well, he didn't marry Lois Lane, but he um, had had a crush on Lois Lane and it is, so it depends on what we're talking about with, with Lois Lane. He married the woman who became the model for Lois Lane, but the woman who was his original model for Lois was a girl who was in his grammar school classroom, where again, as I said at the beginning, everybody was Jewish. And this was a woman um, the who, ended up, when I was writing my book, living in a nursing home in Western Massachusetts, just across the state from where I live. And when I interviewed her about what it was like having her name of Lois and her story and a young kid named Jerry's crush on her, you know, cast her into this famous limelight, um, she thought it was brilliant, as brilliant as Jerry's ultimate wife, uh, the model for Lois thought, and it was just, it was all these dreams coming true. And Jerry's dream came true in that his story was published. His dream came true in that he got to tell his father's story and bring his father back to life. And it was his dream coming true in that his original crush, this Lois, you know, would become famous because of him and that he'd get to marry, you know, one of his, one of the many Loises over the years. So it was just, and he made a million kids' dreams come true. It was just all about that. And I want to say just one last thing on the Jewish theme. Um, whether it's real or not, I have managed, the, the only consistency in the eight books that I have written is there is a minor or a major Jewish theme to every one of them. So I'm not sure if somebody else had written a biography of Joe McCarthy, if Joe McCarthy's anti-Semitism would have become the theme that it has become in my book. But I think Joe McCarthy, in addition to being anti-red and anti-gay, was anti-Semitic in a way that people never realized over the years. And that was a part of who he was. And I think one of the lessons of this is, if you're Jewish and you grow up with that being as big a piece of your identity as it is, you can find a Jewish theme to just about anything, including the story of Superman or Joe McCarthy or even Bobby Kennedy. Larry, a question from Cy Zilberstein, which is, did you ever meet and interview either Siegel or Schuster, but also can you talk about who among the luminaries in the, in the Superman story you actually did get a chance to meet? Um, so sadly, Siegel and Schuster were both dead by the time I was writing my book. But the good news was I had um, first access to an unpublished memoir by Jerry Siegel, and I felt like I was meeting him and could introduce him to readers in a way that they hadn't seen before because nobody had ever seen his real story as laid out, not by um, any interviewer, but by Jerry himself. Um, I interviewed probably, I don't remember the exact number, probably two or 300 people who helped bring Superman to life everywhere from radio to television to the movies. I interviewed all the people who were still alive, who had written his comic book story from the earliest days and who were doing it today. I became pals with a guy who was running DC Comics, a um, Jewish guy named um, Paul, help me Lisa, uh, the, I'm I'll tell you in a second. Remember. I will think of the name, but the- And he and passed away to, very recently. Yes. So the bottom line is um, you talk to everybody you can and the people who aren't still around, you figure out a way to get the story that they have written down and 
um, have left behind as sort of a trail on all of this. But the, the one consistency other than the Jewish themes that I just mentioned in the eight books that I've written is I'm always writing books about people who are either dead or ancient. And so it is always a race against the time to get to the people who know their stories. And with Superman, I was interviewing people who were in their early hundreds, many who were in their 90s, and endless people in their 70s and 80s. And it was a blast because whether I did a good job or a bad job telling this story, I was the last one who was gonna get to them. And this was their last chance to tell their stories. Just a question. I think I got, I think, oh, sorry, Ari, do you wanna? Yeah, I wanna ask one question and then, and then we'll, we'll go back to you. So when, when you wrote your book about Joe McCarthy, the question came up, why write that book? What was new in, um, you know, uh, in what you found on Joe McCarthy, which you talked about in your prior program. Um, so I have the same question of Superman. I mean, were there lots of books out on Superman? And if not, why not? And if so, why did you think that your writing a book would change, would add something new to the area? Sure. So when you're writing a book and when you're writing a biography, you want one of two things. You either want what happened with my first book, which was a biography of the so-called father of public relations, a man named Edward Bernays. You want to be there as the first one writing about them. And I was the first one writing about him. Or you want there to be a hundred books out on the character that you're writing about, which suggests to your publisher that they matter. And there were a hundred books entirely or at least indirectly about Superman. And I don't think I had to convince my publisher that Superman mattered. Then what you want when you're the 101st book, you want some new angle. And my new angle was partly that I had access to the memoir of Jerry Siegel and I could tell the story about the birth of Superman in a way that nobody had. And partly that I had a strange new approach to the book um, telling Superman's story as a real life biography as if he was a living character. And I was saying to them, this is a strange new way of approaching a fictional character, but I think we can pull it off. And it was saying, we need now at that moment, and the truth is we needed every moment, an understanding of our longest lived hero and trying to understand why his story resonates for that day. And Superman, Superman in a way has um, been reinvented um, perpetually. He is um, somebody who gives us a different hero in terms of the way he looks and in terms of the issues that he's grabbing hold to, a different hero for every era of Superman. And at the moment that I was proposing this as a book, DC Comics and Warner Brothers were proposing to give us an entirely new movie version of Superman that they said was going to be even better than the Christopher Reeves original movies. Now, I don't think their boast ended up coming true, but this guy, um, Clavel, I think is the way his name is pronounced, um, who is the new Superman did give us a new Superman and there was an incredible hype around that. And my book tried to capture um, that hype and Warner Brothers actually helped us in lots of ways. They released all the press about Superman, their new Superman hero, using my book as a way of saying, here is who Superman is. And they gave all the people on the movie set, my book as a way of saying, You've got to understand the history of Superman when you're taking on the character. And here's a biography of him that can do that. So I had ways, all that really matters is that I talked them into doing the book that I wanted to do anyway, but I had lots of evidence on how to spin it to convince them to do that. But that's interesting ongoing context that's changed over time. Um, there are two questions about what do you think about Cavalier and Clay and Michael Chabon and his book? So I think that book was so brilliant that at the end, when I started nearing the end of the book, I would parse out five pages a night so that the book wouldn't end for me. And I dragged on the, the finishing the book um, endlessly because I thought that he did such a brilliant job of taking the myth behind Superman 
and giving us an entire new mythical story about it. If you have not read, um, it would be rude of me to tell you to go out and buy my book, Superman, but I think I can say that you should go out and buy the book, Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon, because he's a brilliant author and that is by far his best book. And it's by far the best book that's ever been written about the whole theme of Superman. Can you talk about how Superman has changed over time? Uh, that was another yes. question uh, in chat. And that was from Cynthia Weber. Great. So Superman in the earliest days was taking on um, the characters of the time. He, he Superman came out during the New Deal era, and he was a New Deal kind of hero. He was definitely left of center. He was taking on everything from corrupt landlords to crime and injustice in America. And he was the perfect era during the FDR New Deal leftist version of America. He was the hero for his times. He ended up in the 1950s when we were involved in fighting a cold war. He became the all-American hero who stood up to the Russians and stood up during the time of the Cold War to our Cold War enemies. Um, in the 60s, when America became a hipper place and long hair and cooler clothing became the thing, Superman's hairstyles grew longer. His clothing grew less fusty and more funky. Um, and in more recent times, when we need a hero to stand up and remind us what truth and justice and the real American way um, are all about. Superman has given us that hero that we can go back to. Um, we don't have to make America great again because Superman has been making America great from the early days, 80 years ago to today. And I think that it is great that his creators keep him up to date. It is great that he takes on the accoutrements of that moment and it is great that the essential elements of who Superman is go back to the Mishnah in terms of truth and justice and peace. Um, so here's a question from Peter Shapiro asking how Superman was accepted outside of the United States. So I was intrigued by that. And everywhere that Lisa and I traveled during the time that I was writing Superman and everywhere that I researched in the world, I realized that at some magical moment in its early days, Superman was translated into a hundred languages and the movies were hits all across the world and that it wasn't just the American way. The American way symbolized a sense of freedom and democracy that people all over the world aspired to. So the more downtrodden the country, the more Superman became a resonant hero for them as well as for us. Um, thanks, Larry. This is an interesting question from uh, Jeff Kaufman and Mary Kraft. George Reeves was an interesting character. What do you think about him and how he played the character? Did you review those TV shows for your book? I did. So I want you all to imagine if you can call it work to every day pick up Superman comic books and read them, to watch old tapes of George Reeves, who was the TV, and in my mind, given when I grew up, was always what I envisioned Superman in the flesh and blood to look and be like, and to watch Christopher Reeves and other movies, and again, to call that work. And I spent endless time talking to um, everybody who was connected to that original George Reeves Superman uh, series. I talked to the woman who played, the woman who was the original, um, Phyllis Coons was her name, who was the original uh, Lois Lane in that TV series. I talked to the guy, and now I'm gonna blank on his name, who was the original Jimmy Olsen, who became my great pal. And we spent hours talking together out in person in LA and then by phone endlessly after that. And everybody who was connected with that, sadly, as we know, uh, George Reeves was gone, but I also looked at the story of what really happened to George Reeves. Did he commit suicide? What happened in terms of his death? And that's all in there in the book. 
But again, it was a blast. It was trying to take these flesh and blood characters and look at their identification with the fantasy characters and see how for the rest of their lives, these characters defined who these real actors were because it was the most famous role that they ever played. And uh, Wendy Lupo has just pointed out that uh, Jack Larson was Jackie the person Larson. who played uh-huh. Jimmy Olsen. And then there's another question from Avram Baskin, which is, in the book, you were careful to be neutral when you discussed George Reeves' death. Do you have an opinion about whether it was a murder or suicide? And so I'm going to answer that question um, the same way I answer the question that people perpetually ask me when I was touring on the Bobby Kennedy book about what really happened, who really killed Jack Kennedy, and who really killed Bobby Kennedy. And the answer is, in the book, I looked at every theory that there was, and I talked to the people who did all the original reports. And in the end, um, I can't do any better than the Warren Commission or than the investigation of Bobby's death or than what happened with George Reeves. Um, What I can tell you is that Bobby Kennedy never believed that the full story on his brother's death ever came out, but he believed if he had become president, that he was going to, as one of his earliest things that he would do, is really look at all the original evidence. And I would tell you, if I ever become president, I will do the same thing with the George Reeves death and really investigate that. But there is endless evidence, more than any avid Superman fan would want new evidence of of that whole investigation in my book. And I can't remember every iteration of it, but I remember I ended up trusting a lot of the official reports on it. And including, didn't you go to the coroner's office and see the coroner's I did, and that coroner's yeah. report is is in there. And the um, uh, I have to also say, having written the, the Joe McCarthy book and having gotten access many years after the fact to McCarthy's medical records, I have less trust than I did when I wrote the Superman book and what the coroners tell us, because the coroners told us that Joe McCarthy died of acute hepatitis and the, all the official medical records from Bethesda Naval Hospital make clear that he died of being a uh, over-the-top alcoholic, and he died of acute alcohol poisoning. So the coroners sometimes give us political verdicts, as I saw in the case of Joe McCarthy. Let's go back to Superman himself, and can you talk about kryptonite? Such a wonderful and compelling piece of the story. Um, when was it introduced? Was Superman uh, kryptonite allergic at the start? And before that, what was his Achilles heel? Yes, so Superman, uh, kryptonite was not introduced in the earliest days. And I think that kryptonite was partly introduced as a device, as a Jewish device, um, by Jerry Siegel. And it was introduced for Jerry, um, Jerry Superman hero to have a perpetual reminder of the planet that he came from. And in this case, the reminder was of his vulnerability. But I think it was, in a way, um, in an era of the Holocaust, it was this child of survivors of the Holocaust. His parents had escaped Eastern Europe at a time when they could still do that. And, And it was a reminder of the world of Jerry's Jewish world that had been destroyed. And that may be my reading too much into it, but from everything that I read about what Jerry said in his memoir, I'm convinced that it was, again, a reminder of where we had come from. We're coming to the end of the hour, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to bundle um, two questions in one, Larry, and then, um, so the, the first is, can you talk about Lex Luthor? and who was the model for the villain. And then segueing to another question, um, if you can say a few words about what you're working on now. Yes, so Lex Luthor, um, shortly after the time that Jerry Siegel's father, Michael, the haberdasher, was killed, somebody wrote a letter to the editor of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, signed L. Luthor, I think it was, and it was arguing against vigilante justice of the kind that Jerry was in fact promoting in his comic book, Superman. And I think that that stuck in Jerry's craw 
and that he could make villains out of anybody he wanted. And why not pick somebody who was writing a letter that he thought was wrong headed in his local newspaper? Um, so I want to say a quick word in the book I'm writing now. Uh, my reward to myself and my publisher's reward to me after spending three years with a character as evil as Joe McCarthy was to get to spend the next three years with three guys who were as uplifting as Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Count Basie. And I'm writing about them because I wrote an earlier book. I don't know how many of you remember as young kids traveling on really elegant trains. And the most elegant way you could travel across America was on these thing called Pullman sleeping cars, where there were very elegant black men named Pullman porters who were taking care of you. And I wrote a book on the Pullman porters and how they gave birth to today's African-American middle class and to the civil rights movement. And when I interviewed the Pullman porters, they promised me that I would someday write two other books one was on Satchel Page, their hero, and I wrote a book about him. And the other was on the three favorite passengers they, that they ever carried on their trains. And they were named Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie. So this book is keeping a promise to the Pullman Porters. It is using their life as a way to what I think is looking at the birth of the civil rights movement in America, because my book is looking at these three guys mainly off the bandstand, where they traveled, how they traveled, who their side men and women were, the kind of lives that they lived. And the most interesting thing that I wanna look at in their book is how they played in bands that were mixed race bands, and they played for mixed race audiences in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when Jim Crow was firmly in place in America, and they helped prove to white America that black men could be great artists and great human beings. And long before we had Brown versus Board of Education or any legal decisions, we had Ellington, Armstrong, and Basie making great music and giving it to the world. Um, so I want to say, speaking of heroes, one last thing before we wrap the program up today. I want to say thank you to my wife for doing a great job of acting as my interlocutor. And I want to say thank you to a hero out there in Orange County named Ari Katz. I don't know if all of you realize how lucky you are to have him putting together programs like this. Today, you got two of them. One from Israel where technology failed him, but his musicians didn't. And the other is doing, you know, I don't know what number 100 program this is, but I have done programs for Jewish community centers across America in big cities and small towns. And there's nobody who pulls together more good things around Jewish themes and around uplifting themes generally than Ari Katz. So, you may not recognize, because you're spoiled by him, just how good and how rare he is, but he is. And I want to thank you all for giving up another um, Sunday to talk to me about my obsession and fetish with Superman. I want to end by saying that this, this book is a great read. It really is. And I, I agree with you. I think most people can't handle it because they're used to reading the comics. But um, I've enjoyed it. What I enjoyed most, I would say, is learning the backstory of Superman and, and really how this all came about in a way by luck. These, these two young Jewish uh, men from young people, like young boys from Cleveland, how they wrote a story and how it finally got published and where it went from there is, is in a way a story of luck, but not. And also that I love that they're, they're, they're the father, Mich Michal Siegel is from Lithuania, which is my, he's from Kovna, I believe, according to your book. So there's great stories in here, but what, what I really liked the most was how you connected the evolution of the Superman story from the comic to the radio show, to the um, cartoon, to the shorts that were before the movies, to the movies. Um, and, and what's amazing about technology now is as I read the book, I just Googled each of those. So I listened to the radio, I listened to a radio broadcast and I watched um, uh, the, uh, the initial um, cartoons and then the shorts and then the first TV show, which I'd never seen before. So I wanted to thank you, Larry, for this book. And um, wish you good luck on your next book. Your writing is excellent. It's easy to read. 
It's very informative. You always add details other people don't add. We're very lucky to have you as a writer and you as a CSP speaker. I hope you'll come back and talk to us about one of your other books in another few months. So thank you very much. And thank you, Lisa, for a great interview. Much so, appreciated. Can I get one last word in here? You said it, Ari, really eloquently. It was about luck with the two of them. I would just add one last word. It was about luck and heart. And these kids had extraordinary heart as well as good luck. Thank you all. Larry, people asked if Thanks. they can get a signed book. So is there a way they can. to buy a book? So they can. So just my email address, if you email me, I will send you um, a signature plate. If you buy the book and send me an email, my email is just my name, L-A-R-R-Y-T-Y-E at gmail.com. And I'd be glad to send a signature plate. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for spending so much time with CSP today. Thank you, Lisa. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.